Hi, I'm Dan Bonnebeck, and I want to talk to you today about Confucius's conception of virtue. Confucius is the most influential figure in the history of China. And at the beginning of every course in which I cover ethics, I begin with Confucius, not only because I think his theory is especially interesting, but also because he gives us an outline of what ethics is all about. I have a separate video where I'll talk about the three basic questions of ethics and the most fundamental questions that any ethical theory has to answer. But let me briefly review them here so that we can see what the structure of Confucius's theory is. It's a theory that outlines the basic tasks of ethics in a way that is clearer, I think, than most subsequent ethicists manage. So let's take a look at what Confucius does. First of all, if we ask, what is ethics itself? It is a part of philosophy. It's the practical part of philosophy, the part that has to do with, well, <laughs> what we do, what kind of people we ought to be. So if philosophy itself is the pursuit of wisdom, then practical philosophy, ethics, is the pursuit of practical wisdom. Well, what's practical wisdom? It's a question of good judgment about practice about what to do, what kind of person to be, how to go about deciding. And indeed, as I see it, those are the three most fundamental questions of ethics. So if we think about that and think, where do we need help in pursuing good judgment? How do we attain good judgment? And about what? Here are those three basic questions of ethics. First of all, there's a question of character. What kind of person should I be? I can ask big picture questions about who I am, who I ought to be, what kind of person I want to be, what kind of character, character traits I should develop, which ones I should avoid, what are character strengths, what are character weaknesses that I should try to overcome. A second question is a question of action. What should I do? I face a particular problem or I'm thinking about making some big decision in my life. I think, what should I do? Or are there things that I should really avoid doing? Ethics helps me decide. And the last question is, well, how do we do that? <laughs> how do we decide when we're faced with hard questions, or for that matter, even easy questions about what to do or what kind of person to be? We generally think, for example, that we should be honest rather than dishonest. How do we go about deciding in a particular case, though, whether in this case we really need to tell the truth or whether it would be better to tell a lie? Some ethicists are going to say, it's always better to tell the truth. Some will say, well, I don't know. Sometimes the truth might be awfully damaging and there might be no benefit to learning the truth. So how do we face questions like that? How do we go about deciding? That's an ethical question too. So we can ask, is one of these questions fundamental? And some ethicists think character is fundamental, that basically the Crucial question of ethics is, what kind of person should I be? And then questions of action or decision follow from that. What should I do? What a virtuous person would do. How do I decide? The way a virtuous person would decide. Others address that question and say, no, it's action that's fundamental. The basic question of ethics is really just, what should I do? And they see character and decision making as following from that. And so it's very easy to explain. I should be the kind of person who does what he ought to do. <laughs> and I should decide in a way that reliably produces the right outcome and tells me the correct thing that I ought to do. We could have a different approach. We could say, no, it's decision that's fundamental. And so action and character follow from a technique of making ethical decisions. A lot of modern philosophers tend to approach ethics that way. Then what should I do? Well, whatever the right method tells me to do. What kind of person should I be? I should be the kind of person who uses that method, who decides in the right way. And so all of those are plausible approaches that people throughout the history of ethics have taken. Some identify some fourth factor and say, well, actually action and character and decision all follow from that fourth thing. Now people have proposed different candidates for that fourth thing. Some think it's a question of God. So for example, I should do what God wants me to do. I should be the kind of person God wants me to be and so on. Some say, no, it's a question of human nature. I should act in a way that's in accordance with deep tendencies in human nature. Some say it's a question of natural law and the system that governs the universe that includes ethical norms. Some say it's a matter of evolution 
and it's a question of survival. I should become the sort of person who can survive, who can thrive, who can be evolutionarily fit, and so on. All of those are possible answers. But there's another option, which as I see it is Confucius's option. It's a pluralist approach to ethics that says, actually all of these are important. We do have to decide on questions of character. What kind of person should I be? We have to answer questions of action and give guidance about what to do. We also have to tell people how to face decisions. How do I decide what kind of person to be or what to do? In easy cases, in hard cases. Those, as Confucius sees it, are independent questions. They are three different components of ethics. They have something to do with each other. It would be odd to say I'm the kind of person I ought to be, but I'd never do what I ought to do. So there are links between them, and as we'll see, he develops a number of those links. But they're not the same question, and none of them reduce to the others, and can simply be derived from the other questions. Well, let's talk some about Confucius himself. As I mentioned, he's the most influential person in the history of China. He lived from 551 to 479 BC, um, and so was part of the thinkers who thrived during what is known as the Axial Period, Confucius, founding Confucianism, Lao Tzu, founding Taoism, um, a variety of other people, the Buddha, for example, founding Buddhism, or Mahavira, founding Jainism. And so Confucius is writing at a time when a lot of things are happening around the world. Intellectually, there are lots of movements of people. China itself is in turmoil. It's divided into many different states. Later, there's a period known as the Warring States period. He is a little bit earlier than that, but as you can see, things are still very much divided. He's a native of Lu, and he travels throughout the area as a diplomat for a while, trying to get people to live together peacefully and eventually to unite and to adopt his principles. It doesn't quite work out that way. In any case, the record of his teachings is in the five classics of Confucianism, the most influential of which is the Analects. The Analects, according to legend, were written down by Confucius after he retired. Most people think they were actually compiled by students and students of students some years later. In any case, Confucius did establish a huge reputation as a teacher. He taught as many as 3,000 students during his time, and many of them went on to prominent careers. Confucius himself was born into a noble family, but his father died when he was three, and so he grew up in poverty. He was somebody who really developed, you might say, his own way of doing things, working at first in sort of trivial jobs, and eventually becoming a revered teacher. According to Confucius, there is no fourth factor to look for in ethics. We can't look outside humanity for something like evolution or God or human nature or something else to establish the foundation for ethics. One of his students, Zikong, said, we may hear the master, that is Confucius, on letters and culture, but we may not hear him on human nature and the way of heaven. It's not to say he thinks human nature is irrelevant or the way of heaven, i.e. the divine, is irrelevant. He talks about it at certain points, mentions it, but he doesn't really think it can be known, and so he doesn't see it as something that can provide any kind of foundation for answering questions like what kind of person should I be or what should I do. Instead, we have to look to humanity itself. We have to think about what we are like. Here is what he says at one point when people ask him about serving the spirits, in other words, about religious obligations. He says, if you can't serve men, how can you serve spirits? Chi Lu added, I venture to ask about death. Confucius answered, if you don't know about life, how can you know about death? So we have to look inside. We have to look at ourselves and at the way in which people live together. He says the value of the way, that is to say the right way to live, ethical truths, depends on man. The value of man doesn't depend on the way. It's not something coming from outside onto us. It is something that we develop as ways to live together. So it does have independent components. There are questions of character, questions of action, questions of decision. What kind of person should I be? What should I do? How do I decide? And Confucius develops components of his ethical theory to answer each of those questions. So it has a kind of tripartite structure, actually in two different senses, as we'll see. 
One of them, he gives us a theory of character, of what he calls ren, usually translated as virtue, but also it's a bit more specific. I'll talk about that in a moment. He also talks about the question, what should I do? The question of action. That's summarized in his theory of li, or propriety. And then the question of how I should decide. That is the part of his theory where he talks about yi, that is to say, righteousness, piety, doing the right thing for the right reason, deciding on the basis of the right kinds of reasons. So those are the key concepts of Confucius's ethical theory, and they add up to what he refers to as the Tao, the path, the way, the right way to live. So the right way to live includes questions of what I ought to be, what I ought to do, and how I ought to decide. It's not reducible to any one of those. It includes all three of them, and all three are required for me to understand the right way to live. That includes the right way to build my character, the right way to act, and the right way to go about deciding. I want to turn to each of these in turn. So let's take a look first at his theory of Li, of propriety, which is his theory of action, answering the question, what should I do? Well, what I should do here is actually a rather broad question. It's a question of propriety, as he puts it. In other words, I need to do what's appropriate. And before we go on to the details of that, I want to point out that this is actually an approach that differs from a lot of Western approaches to ethics. We tend to think of morality as something pretty specific, and a huge amount of what you ought to do is actually independent of that. When Confucius talks about propriety, he means something broader. What do I have in mind? Well, how do you behave in all sorts of social contexts? It's a question sometimes of ethics. Yeah, you shouldn't do plainly unethical things, but there's a lot more to it than that. Some computer scientists have talked about scripts, or schemata is the psychological term, for these ways in which you behave in certain kinds of situations. And Confucius means to include all that. Appropriate behavior is moral behavior, but it's also socially appropriate behavior. So, for example, we can talk about what is legitimate behavior in a classroom, let's say. And you're expected to behave in one sort of way in a classroom. There are different rules about behavior that's appropriate in a movie theater, for example, or in a restaurant, remember those? <laughs> or in a bar, or <laughs> this is a photograph, a real photograph of UT sorority sisters in 1945 inside a dorm room. I assume that nothing much has changed. Anyway, there are different things that are expected and appropriate in all of those different settings. A football game. Again, a different set of expectations. And then here, being interviewed on a national TV show, very restrictive set of expectations. Look at the camera, don't look anywhere else. All of those have different expectations. I can shout Texas fight at a football game. It would be highly inappropriate to do that in a classroom or in a TV studio. And so there are different patterns of behavior. And Confucius says, look, what I ought to do, what kind of person I ought to be, it includes all of that. It's not just thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, and so on. It's a question of all of those other things. You should be the kind of person who behaves appropriately in all sorts of different social settings. Of course, what's appropriate can vary with your culture, and that means you should really obey traditional social rules. You should do what your culture expects of you most of the time. Now, of course, it might be that your culture expects something really immoral, then it's different. But overall, propriety is a matter of observing these traditional social rules. So it's a matter of not only doing that, but doing that and developing the right habits out of that. He says, really, here's one of the connections between these different questions of ethics. If you do what you ought to do and learn how to behave appropriately in a wide variety of settings, you're going to develop the right kinds of habits, and that will build your character in the right way. You will develop the right sorts of character traits, the virtues of feeling, the virtues of action. You will find yourself feeling what you ought to feel, reacting the way you ought to react, doing what you ought to do. This does sometimes require subduing yourself. You might be sitting there in a classroom, for example, thinking, but I'd really rather be talking to my friend. You might be in a TV studio saying, but I really want to look at that monitor. <laughs> you can't do that. And so 
This requires you to conform your activities and your responses to the expectations of the people around you. You may feel like just getting up and walking out of the room at certain points, but you realize that, that would be inappropriate, and so you can't do it. Confucius says you have to learn to subdue yourself. It's hard. He says if you can do that, even for one day completely, you're a person of complete virtue. <laughs> so no one expects perfection. Certainly Confucius doesn't expect perfection here. But he does say that's the goal, and that's how we develop the right kinds of character traits. There is one rule for action that really is for him a moral rule. It's not just a question of adapting to a particular set of social expectations and doing the appropriate thing. He says there is one rule that persists throughout all of life, all social settings, all social interactions, and all kinds of relationships with people. And that is something he refers to as Zhang. It is sometimes translated as reciprocity or as likening to oneself. He says <laughs> it's a question of this. What you don't want done to yourself, don't do to others. Sometimes this is called the silver rule. It's very closely associated with the golden rule. Treat others as you would have them treat you. In this case, it's don't treat others the way you wouldn't want them to treat you. It's a negative version of that, which is why it's sometimes called the silver rule. It pretty much takes certain things and rules them out. It doesn't so much give you positive obligations about what to do. But he says it is the one rule of practice throughout life. In all social settings, this is what we should do. If you wouldn't want anybody to do it to you, don't do it to others. So I don't want you to think that Confucius is simply some kind of social relativist about all of this. It's not just do what you're expected to do, what other people around you want you to do, and so on. It's rather, yes, try to do all of that. But the big constraint, the one that applies across the board, is if you don't want other people to do it to you, don't do it to others. And that appears time and again throughout the Analects. He does have other principles of a real moral character. One question that arises in a lot of moral contexts is, how do I respond if people injure me, if I'm treated unjustly? Confucius says, repay kindness with kindness and injury with justice. Seek justice. No eye for an eye here. Someone puts out your eye, seek justice. Someone strikes you on the cheek, he doesn't say, strike them on the cheek. He doesn't say, turn the other cheek. He says, respond with justice. And so that is something that is in between, you might say, a variety of other approaches to that question. The Taoists, by the way, criticize this. They say, no, respond with a sort of natural, spontaneous response. If your response to being slapped on the cheek is to slap back, slap back. <laughs> if it's to turn the other cheek, do it. If it's to run away, if it's to call the police, whatever it is, Go with your intuitive response. Trust it. Confucius doesn't trust our intuitive responses very much at all. He thinks they have to be trained, they have to be developed, they have to be educated. And so it's important to say what is just here and to seek justice, not simply to seek revenge or to forgive across the board. He wants something that is different from that. He says, ask what the right outcome is and seek that. And it won't necessarily be your intuitive response it may well be something quite different. There is another kind of connection between propriety and virtue. At one point, a student asks about perfect virtue, ren, the Chinese term. The master, Confucius, says, to subdue oneself and to return to propriety is virtue. If a man can subdue himself and return to propriety for one day, all under heaven will ascribe virtue to him. Then he asks his student a question. Is the practice of virtue from oneself alone, or does it depend on others? In other words, is it a question of social expectation, or is it something independent of that? And notice the student's response. This is a classic. He says, I want to ask about these steps of how to attain this. Notice the deflection here. He doesn't answer Confucius's question at all. But Confucius doesn't point that out. He responds in the following way. He says, don't look at what's contrary to propriety. Don't listen to what's contrary to propriety. Don't speak what's contrary to propriety. Don't make a move that is contrary to propriety. So in short, he's saying, here's how you develop virtue. You learn to restrain yourself, to not look at what's inappropriate. Don't listen to it. 
Don't speak it. Don't make a move that's inappropriate. Try to conform to that. And as you learn to conform to these expectations, keeping in mind, by the way, that general rule of reciprocity that applies across the board, then you're going to be building the right kind of character. So you see this sort of passage represented in all sorts of art. Here is an ancient Chinese carving. It's often monkeys, by the way, that are shown as, you know, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. Um, this is <laughs> the members of the Clinton administration, including Bill Clinton himself, putting this into practice. Hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. And then I don't know what Sandy Berger on the right there is doing. He seems to be, well, I, I have no idea. <laughs> But anyway, that is, in general, Confucius's approach to the question of what should I do. I should observe reciprocity across the board, but otherwise I should conform myself to appropriate expectations. Let's focus on the next question. How do I decide? How do I actually make decisions about what to do and what kind of person to be? Confucius's key concept here is yi. Righteousness. In other words, it's a question of doing the right thing for the right reason. Doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. The master said the superior person's mind is conversant with righteousness, yi. The inferior person's mind is concerned with gain. So don't think about your own self-interest. Don't focus on what's in it for me. Instead, think what's the right thing to do and do the right thing because it's right. So the question of how to behave, really, is to think about what is just, what is right, what you ought to be doing, not what's to your advantage, what's to the advantage of your friends, what's to the disadvantage of your enemies, and so on. No, think about what is right and do it because it's right. The superior person in the world, Confucius says, isn't for anything or against anything. He follows what's right. And at one point he says, the superior person thinks of virtue. The small person thinks of comfort. The superior person thinks of the law. The small person thinks of favors. So think about what is the right thing to do. Focus on the question of ethics, not on questions of advantage or personal gain. So what should motivate me isn't selfishness. It isn't a desire for gain or advantage. I am to do what is right because it's right. I do the right thing for its own sake, not for the sake of some kind of advantage or gain or self-interest. But now let's turn to the question that Confucius spends the most time on, the question of character. What kind of person should I be? A question of, well, Ren, as he puts it, a question of virtue. I should be a person of virtue. But that's really not very much of an answer. What is virtue? <laughs> How do we understand that? Well, there are a variety of translations that try to give us the flavor of what Confucius has in mind, in addition to simply virtue. Some people translate it as benevolence, some as justice, some as kindness, some as love even. And the idea is that it really does involve a concern for other people, caring about other people. And so it's not simply a question of me being a certain way, though as we'll see, some of the most crucial aspects of it do pertain to just me myself but it also involves a certain attitude about others, one of benevolence, kindness, one of caring or concern about other people, empathy, you might say. So, in general, if we start thinking about this problem of ethics, that is to say, the question of what kind of person to be, and start thinking about character strengths or virtues, one of the problems we face is that there are many different possible virtues. Really, I've got this image of the stars here to indicate there are probably thousands of virtues we could identify. One time I set myself the task of writing down all the terms we have in English for virtue. After 45 minutes, I gave up. I had about 250 things on my list, and I realized I'm not done. I can keep going and going. And then, of course, there are all the virtues that other languages identify that we don't even have terms for in English. And so you could go on to thousands of virtues if you kept a complete list. So what is it to have a theory of that? How do we pick out a few of those stars, a few of those character traits, as really the most central? How do you have a theory of any of this? In astronomy, you have a theory that tries to describe the laws of the stars. Is that our task? Do we try to develop the laws of these character traits of virtues? Do we instead say, well, here are some that are really the most important, that are really central in some way? But what does that mean? 
So that is one approach. We could say some virtues are really central, but we might mean a bunch of different things by central. For example, we might say, well, they're the most important ones. They're the ones that really come up most of the time. They're the most useful. We might say, if we have those virtues, then the others come more easily. They increase our capacity for virtue. Some of them you might say, well, look, if you have these, then you're of course going to have the others. They really bring a bunch of other virtues in their wake. Well, it does lead us to ask some basic questions. What virtues or character traits do you think are most important, do you most value? If someone else were to describe you, what would you want them to say about you? Even if you're not that way now, what would you hope in the future they would say about you? That's an important question to answer, and Confucius does have an answer to that question. He thinks there are five traits that are especially important, that are really central in ethics. So here are the basic components for him of virtue of Ren. He says, to be able to practice five things everywhere under heaven constitutes perfect virtue. Here they are. Seriousness, generosity, sincerity, diligence, and kindness. He thinks those are absolutely fundamental. They're not the only virtues he talks about. He mentions a variety of others, but they are of central importance. And a big question for us is, well, what does he mean by that? Most important? Most useful? Others follow from having these? Notice he seems to think that. He says, if you can do these five, you've got it. And so it seems as if he thinks, if you really master these five, other virtues will follow. You will have them as well. Well, <laughs> we can ask as well about the nature of virtue. What is it that makes these virtues? What is good about them? And what is virtue really like? His answer is mentioned in the Analects, but really developed in a work called The Doctrine of the Mean. Virtue is a mean. It is a mean between extremes. We'll see a theory of this kind in Aristotle. But the virtue is something in between two different vices, two different bad traits of character, two different things to be avoided. So, for example, he's differing from the common sense view of these things. In common sense, we think of virtues as having opposites. So we would say, okay, seriousness, let's grant that's a virtue. What would be the opposite of that? Maybe being unserious, being frivolous. It's a virtue to be generous. The opposite of that seems to be stingy. If sincerity is a virtue, the opposite of that is being insincere. If diligence, being hardworking, is a virtue, well then being lazy would be the opposite. Kindness is a virtue, then being unkind or mean would be the vice. That's the common sense attitude. And Confucius says, look, there's something to that, but actually there is a different kind of picture he has in mind. Getting things right is a difference between being, for example, frivolous and then something else. You can be, in effect, he's saying, too serious, too generous, too sincere, too diligent, too kind. So his picture is really this. I can be too serious, in effect. I can become somber. I can be too generous. I can become utterly profligate. I can be too sincere. I can be reckless with the truth. Now, I should be sincere, and that includes honesty, but it includes some other things, as we'll see. However, to be too honest, to be blunt, <laughs> you might say, can be reckless. To be too hardworking, too diligent, can be just a question of being dull. The workaholic isn't any fun. All work and no play and all of that. And then finally, you can actually be too kind. You can become indulgent. You can spoil the person you're trying to be kind to. So kindness, like all of those other virtues, he says, is actually a mean between extremes. You can vary in different ways. You can, in effect, give too much to someone <coughs> as well as too little to someone. Those aren't the only virtues he mentions, as I said. He talks about being respectful, being cautious, straightforward, strong, humble, faithful, a variety of others. And those two are means between extremes. So just as we have those extremes for the central ones, we have these extremes for the others. Being respectful is a mean between being disrespectful and being, he calls it bustling, being too eager to please. So eager to please, you become annoying. Um, being cautious is a mean between being careless and being timid. Being straightforward 
is a mean between being devious and being rude. Being strong is a mean between being weak and then being extravagant. And finally, humility itself is a mean between being proud and being self-effacing. You can, in effect, be too humble or too straightforward, too respectful, and so on. <clears throat> now, an interesting question arises, which I'll leave you with. Can you be too virtuous? Can you have too much ren? Surprisingly, he says yes. You might think the opposite of virtue is vice, and that's all there is to say. But Confucius says not so. For him, the opposite of virtue, the opposite of ren, is being small-minded. And what is it to have too much virtue? He calls it being simple. Now, I think that's intriguing. Most philosophers have thought, you can't be too moral. Morality is doing the right thing. You can't do too much of the right thing. But Confucius says, actually, you can. You can become simple in your way of dealing with things. What would be an example of that? <clears throat> Maybe somebody who is so dedicated to their conception of morality, they become annoying. I tend to think of Lisa Simpson on The Simpsons TV Show as a good example of this. At one point, Homer, in fact, says she's so moral <laughs> and complains about it. And Confucius would be sympathetic. Yeah, you should be moral. You should be concerned about what to do. But on the other hand, you have to live your life. And so Confucius would say you can be too moral, just as you can be too serious, too generous, too kind, and so on. You can become so obsessed with morality that you forget about the complexity of life. You can forget that there are a lot of other people around you. There are a lot of things you care about. And so Confucius doesn't want us to be one-dimensional in our moral thinking. He wants us to be multi-dimensional, not only in recognizing that character, action, and decision are three different components of ethics, but also in realizing that in ethics, there are a lot of different virtues we care about, and there are a lot of different situations of life and concerns of life we care about. We should not become so obsessed with a moral vision that we forget everything else about what's important in living. So for Confucius, ethics itself has its place. It is not the queen of all of these, you might say, conceptions of what we ought to be doing. Instead, it's one among a variety of others. Yes, I should be concerned with questions of what kind of person I should be and what I should do and how I should decide. But I should also think about life in a broader way. That's one crucial set of questions. It's not the only one, and we mustn't forget that.